will travel back uh, other ways as well. And we've worked with the Department of Defense to say where there are space available, we'll be able to bring them back on those flights as well. It's all government effort to make sure we get them back. They're going to they're gonna help us every place they can. Secretary Nesbitt, I've talked about it a couple times. Well, Thank you, Secretary. A uh, question on Iran again. Is there any consideration to relax some sanctions on Iran during the coronavirus crisis that they've been particularly hard hit? That's an important question. The, the whole world should know that humanitarian assistance into Iran is wide open. It's not sanctioned. We've offered to provide assistance to the Iranians as well. I talked with Dr. Tedros from the World Health Organization about this. Uh, we're doing everything we can to facilitate both the humanitarian assistance moving in and to make sure that financial transactions connected to that can take place as well. There is no sanction on medicines going to Iran. There's no sanctions on humanitarian assistance going into that country. They've got a terrible problem there, and we want that humanitarian medical health care assistance to get to the people of Iran. But the sanctions themselves, no, no movement. We are, we, are, we are working to do all the things we've had in place for the first three years here to deliver security for the American people. They know the answer. Iran. They know the answer. Iran. The leaders. They know the answer to your question. Wasn't it appropriate for the president to call your department the deep state department at a time when thousands of diplomats are working very hard around the world to combat this pandemic? I've worked with the president for three years now. I know how much he values the people that work on my team. I know when I was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency how much he valued the work we did. I know that he watches our team, Dr. Burks, all the team that's working to push back against this virus to keep America safe. I know how much he values them. What a good answer. Yes, go ahead. Mr. President, can, can I ask a question? Very true, too. Uh, go ahead. Mr. President, no, uh, behind you. Oh, I apologize. Please, go ahead. The news, I have two questions. The first is to Secretary um, Pompeo. The news hours learned that the CDC picked up that there was some sort of virus happening in Wuhan, the coronavirus happening in Wuhan as early as December. When did the CDC start letting other agencies know that there was something in China happening, that this coronavirus was happening? And then when did the whole government approach ha start to happen? So I'll let the CDC or Dr. Fauci, you want to, you want to talk to that? Yeah, Dr. Uh, Secretary Azar, please. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so we were alerted by some discussions that Dr. Redfield, the director of the CDC, had with Chinese colleagues on January 3rd. It's since been known that there may have been cases in December, not that we were alerted in December. Then, Mr. President, the other question I have for you. When Excuse me, we'll do it in a second. Let Mike, yes, may, may, just, may just say yes, one more thing. There, there's been some discussion about China and what they knew and when they knew it. And I've, I've been very critical. We, we, we need to know immediately. The world is entitled to know. The Chinese government was the first to know of this risk to the world. And that puts a special obligation to make sure that data, the data gets to our scientists, our professionals. This is not about retribution. This matters going forward. We're in a, we're in a live exercise here to sure get this right. We, we need to make sure that even today the data sets that are available to every country, including data sets that are available to the Chinese Communist Party, are made available to the whole world. It's, a, it's an imperative to keep people safe. We, we talk about the absence of data sets, not being able to make judgments about what to do. This is absolutely critical. This transparency, this real-time information sharing, isn't, to, isn't about political games or retribution. It's about keeping people safe. And so when you see a delay in information flowing from the Chinese Communist Party to the technical people who we wanted to get into China immediately to assist in this, every moment of delay connected to being able to identify this risk vector, the risk vectors, creates risk to the people all around the world. And so this is why it's not about blaming someone for this. This is about moving forward to make sure that we continue to have the information we need to do our jobs. Mr. Secretary, what, what message do you think it sends to other countries when you have the President of the United States lashing out at reporters? I, I've had my frustration with reporters, too. All I ask when I talk to the media is that you listen to what we say and report it accurately. And it's frustrating. It's frustrating when you see when you see when you see that that doesn't happen. It's it's enormously frustrating. We have a responsibility to tell the American people the truth, and those who are reporting on what it is we're doing and saying have an equal responsibility to report accurately. What message does it send to countries when you're lashing out reporters? I've seen I've seen many things at the State Department be reported wildly inaccurately on on multiple occasions, and I have spoken to those reporters about it each and every time, and I will continue to do so.
Mr. President. Mr. President, um, Senator Johnson has suggested. Well, I'd rather have if you could finish up with the Secretary. Of State. I think I've worn him out, Mr. President. Well, I'll, let me <laughs> Is ask everybody you both. finished, Secretary? Let me of State? ask you both if that's all right, Mr. Secretary. Senator Johnson has suggested that you and the administration may be overreacting. He said, we don't shut down our economy because tens of thousands of people die on the highways. We don't shut down our economies because tens of thousands of people die from the common flu. Uh, at worst, 3.4% of Americans will die from this uh, virus, he said. Uh, what do you say to people that have that view? That's 11 million people he's talking about. Well, I can just say the entire world is agreeing with us because they're all, they all have their choice and uh, everybody's doing the exact same thing. We want to shut it out and uh, we can do that and we'll see what happens in two weeks and three weeks. But uh, if we can save thousands of lives and even millions of lives potentially, you don't know where it goes, but you could be talking about millions of lives. So uh, if you look at the, the world, I mean, you have some very smart people in the world. You have some smart leaders in the world. And everybody's doing it the way we're doing it. I think we're doing a better job than uh, hopefully most, if not all. We're doing a very effective job. But we'll, we'll know better in 14 or 15 days. But, you know, you're talking about hundreds of thousands and maybe more than that numbers of people. And, uh, you know, we can bring our finances back very quickly. We can't bring the people back. Mr. President, to follow up on that, um, there are millions of people out there that share that view that say, I don't really need to shut things down. I don't really need to stay away from the stores. I don't, I can go to the beach. And those people making multiple actions exponentially, it's the difference between life and death. Yeah, I agree it? with that. But I think I'd like to have Anthony answer that because to be honest that's what he does and he uh, we had a lot of uh, a lot of very talented people telling us what they think we should do thank you mr president I, well, I, first of all i think that's a false equivalency to, to to compare traffic accidents with i mean that's totally way out that's really a false equivalency when you have something that is new and it's emerging and you really can't predict totally the impact it's going to have and you take a look at what's going on in China, and you see what's going on right now, right now, in Italy, and what's happening in New York City, I don't think with any moral conscience you could say, why don't we just let it rip and happen and let X percent of the people die? I don't understand that reasoning at all. Okay, so uh, Secretary of State will be leaving. Any other question for you? Go ahead in the back, please. In the back for Mike. Thank you, Mr. President. Excuse me, I didn't call on you. Thank you, Mr. President. Two things. In New York, where cases are doubling every day, they fear that supplies are going to run out in a matter of weeks. Yesterday, uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio called on you to mobilize the military to deliver urgent supplies. Yesterday, he said, quote, the fate of New York City rests in the hands of one man. He is a New Yorker, and right now he is betraying the city he comes from. Um, I've personally spoken to emergency department nurses who say that they've been told not to wear N95 masks because supplies are so low. So how do you respond to those remarks by Mayor de Blasio? Well, and I just think this. I'm, I'm, de I'm not when dealing with supplies yeah. arrive. I'm not dealing with them. I'm dealing with the governor and the governor agrees with me and I agree with him. So far, we've been very much in sync. I, I guess they're not agreeing with each other necessarily. But uh, the relationship with New York, I love New York. I grew up in New York, as you probably have heard. And uh, the relationship's been very good. And uh, I think uh, government and the governor have been getting along incredibly well with the federal government. Okay. Uh, 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 question, Mr. question for Secretary Wolf, if I could. Um, just on, on illegal entries of people who are OTM, how will the turn back process work? Will they be uh, taken to a common area and then put on a plane and sent back to Northern Triangle countries or others? I mean, how would that process work? Again, it, it's a it's a public health <laughs> crisis. So what we're trying to do is limit the uh, the amount of contact that we have with these individuals, not putting them in border patrol facilities, ICE detention facilities, and the like. So it's going to be very rapid. We're going to obviously take them into custody and then and then send them back to a port of entry or other means. So it'll be very quickly. It won't be the six or seven or ten days that we currently have. It'll be uh, much more rapid. But if they are OTM, will you will they be taken to an, an airfield? That's nearby, correct. Or? That's correct. 
and sit back on the president. Absolutely. Any, anybody? Mr. President. Mr. President, who has the president? Who has the president? The checks to Americans. The bill is proposed creates sort of tiers of checks for income. Do you believe philosophically that makes sense? Well, I believe in a lot of things. I want to get workers' money. And whichever way, the best way to get it. And I want to keep the businesses open, too, because without the businesses, they're not going to be getting money for very long. But we're going to be, we're going to be deal, talking. As it's written, is there enough? Uh, or do you want to see not, we'll do something later, I'm sure. I'm sure we'll do that. Wall Street analysts are predicting that unemployment numbers could skyrocket next week. Uh, by some analysts, say as many as three million people applying for unemployment, which would be a historic number in a one-week spread. So, is a thousand-dollar check going to cut it? Is that going to be? We're not talking about a thousand-dollar check. We're talking about much more than that. Uh, we're also talking about. Uh, doing phases. If this doesn't work, we're going to keep doing until we get it going. And frankly, uh, once we get the economy back and once this uh, enemy is defeated, the invisible enemy, as I call it, once it's defeated, we get the economy back, uh, it's going to all come back to us very quickly. It comes back very quickly. We have a tremendous economy. Uh, we do numbers like no other country has ever done before. Number one in the world, if you go back two weeks, and still, obviously, but if you go back two weeks, number one in the world by far. Uh, that money comes back to us very rapidly. Uh, we want to keep it, we want to have it so that when we, not if, but when we win the war with the invisible enemy, when we win it, these companies can immediately start. Not that they have to start rebuilding, which takes a long time. Steve? Are you confident what, what that those are jobs that will come back what if someone applies for an employment this confident. week? What I'm projections confident. for job losses in March and April are you hearing? Well, we're looking at different numbers. We have a best case and a not best case, but, uh, the big thing is to defeat the virus. Once that virus is defeated, Steve, I think uh, everything else falls in place very rapidly. I think you're going to have a tremendous upswing. A lot of people agree with me. A lot of, if you look at your stock market geniuses, and some of whom are not geniuses, but they think they are, uh, a lot of people think that I'm right about that, that once we defeat the, the virus, uh, I think you're going to have a very steep like a rocket ship, it's going to go up and everything will be back. And I really believe we're going to be stronger than ever before. Yeah, go ahead. On the issue of supplies, you've told governors to try to find whatever supplies they yeah. can on their own. Uh, but some of them are now saying when they go to try to buy them, they're being outbid by the federal government. Well, you heard my news conference so, yesterday. So what so what do you not that was, that was sort of yesterday's news. No, what that does happen do? because they want to buy supplies. We want to buy as a backup to them in case they can. And sometimes that will happen. But Regardless of who gets them, when they need them, we're getting them to them. Now, we're doing the Production Act. We're doing it very much. And we have a lot of things cooking right now at a high level. Remember this. Nothing like this has ever happened before. Over 140 countries. And you have supply chains that are broken down for two reasons. Because they can't supply that much and because people are sick. And they can't be on the chain. So you have a lot of interesting things all over the world. You have supply chains that broke down because of the illness and also because of the fact, the quantity. Uh, but we're getting it ordered, we're getting it done, and the, re the if you just have to, look, uh, some of you were at the call yesterday where I spoke with the governors, almost all of the governors, and every one of them was very impressed with what we've done. Uh, go ahead, in the middle, please. There are reports saying that the Labor Department has told states not to disclose their unemployment numbers. Do you agree with that decision? I'd have to talk to him. I would have to talk to him. Just one more clear, clear clarifying Secretary question, State. if I could. On the DPA, I just want to be clear. Are you saying that the administration is requiring these industries to, to create these products or just asking? Just you know, so far we haven't had to. It's an amazing thing that happened. We're getting calls from automobile companies. We're getting calls from other companies saying they have plant capacity. They want to make ventilators. They want to make other things. We are literally being besieged in a beautiful way by companies that want to do the work. They want to do the job. They want to help us. They want to help our country. So we haven't had a problem with that at all. How do you help out states and localities that are trying to bid on things like ventilators and other items that are being outbid by the, the Well, when they call us, they let us know. If there's a conflict, they will call us and we will drop our bid because we want them to go first, because their point, their point of sale. So we've had four or five instances where literally that was happening because, you know, we're both trying to get stuck. And if we're going against, they will call us the smart ones, frankly, will call us and we will immediately, we want them to buy it. 
because it gets to them quicker if they buy it. Okay. Do they know that they're We're really there. They know that. And it's happening more and more where they're calling and they're saying we're bidding against each other. They want to get it. They'll get it much quicker that way. Go ahead, please. Um, Mr. President, a, sec a question for Senator Cruz. Um, you know, Mr. President, there are labs across the country that don't have the testing supplies they need. What specific actions well, is the administration very well. taking? I tell you what. What we, specific actions? We inherited are an being obsolete taken? deal, and we made a good thing out of it. I haven't heard that question in a while, but go ahead. Yeah. Why so, you? so first, uh, in, we're making tremendous progress in terms of lab testing. Tens of thousands of tests are being done every single day, both through the CDC and the public health labs, as well as now through the private sector commercial labs. They're getting to scale. Um, they have supplies. They have high throughput. We do hear anecdotally occasionally of, say, a public health lab or another one that has a concern about this supply or that supply. Um, through FEMA, we actually are standing up a laboratory task force to answer those questions. Usually, it's that the lab people do not understand that there are actually alternative supplies in the marketplace that they are perfectly free to use. We've actually had to put out some common myths and truths about that. For instance, the other day, we were getting calls from governors saying, we don't have swabs, there are no swabs, there are no swabs. Our supply people went, in the open marketplace and bought 200,000 swabs in the open market and I just sent a letter to every governor sending them swabs. So some of it's just they aren't listening or checking with us about all the freedom, all the capacities out there. It's a complex system with 330 million Americans and all of these labs. So sometimes there's a lab that doesn't understand how much flexibility they have and how much supply there is out there. And we're working through the new FEMA integration center to help correct that for folks. Secretary Azar, Secretary Azar. Well, uh, as I said, uh, more and more tests are being performed every day. And as we learn about the results that are being reported around the country of coronavirus tests, our experts continue to look at the numbers and see that uh, some 90% of Americans that are tested uh, do not test positive for the coronavirus. And so it can give you a sense of the magnitude of testing that's going on. We have the number of cases that we've reported today, but it's, it's in some cases near to 10 times that that have been tested. But let me also emphasize how important it was in answering these questions for governors and local officials that the president stood up FEMA uh, and the National Response Center where we briefed governors yesterday. Now, every governor and their state department, state health departments have the ability to reach out with to our regional FEMA administrators. And that's how, as the president said, we're sorting out those potential conflicts between very significant federal purchases and procurements and, uh, and as hospitals and state governments are purchasing as well. I think the new streamlined system operating now in all 50 states and our territories of governors and states going through their regional administrator for FEMA is going to make it more possible for us to ensure that our hospitals, our health care providers have access to what's available on the open market and elsewhere. Mr. Vice President, okay. Mr. Vice President you're the head of the task force. Mm -hmm. You've seen the numbers. You've spoken to average Americans. You're a former governor. What do you say to Americans right now who are watching and who are scared? I would say do not be afraid. Be vigilant. All the experts tell us that the risk of serious illness to the average American for the coronavirus is low. But we need every American to put into practice the president's coronavirus guidelines, 15 days to slow the spread, because the coronavirus is about three times more contagious than the flu, according to our best estimate. And you can contract the coronavirus have very mild symptoms, if any, uh, not even be aware that you have it, and expose someone who is vulnerable to a very serious health outcome. That's the reason why we're encouraging people to avoid groups of more than 10, to not eat in restaurants, but to use drive throughs to wash their hands on a regular basis. And particularly, we're going to continue, as the President has directed us, to focus on the most vulnerable population, which are seniors, with serious underlying health conditions or anyone with an underlying immunodeficiency. It's those people we need to care for, but it's going to take all of us working together 
to make sure they're safe. Mr. Vice President, on the issue of ventilators, Mr. Vice President. Because you just said that you haven't had to require companies to up their production of medical supplies. But you said last night you invoked but the DPA. Yeah. When we need something, when we need something because of the act, when we need something, we order something. And uh, as you know, two days ago, I invoked the act, which was a big step. I'm not sure that it had been done before, certainly not very much. And uh, when we need something, we will use the act. What has happened is, before we even go out, many, many companies, great companies, companies in a totally different business are willing to do things and make things, because that's what they do. They make product. They're willing to make product for us, medical product, that we need very badly for the states, that the states can't get, they haven't been able to get. And, you know, most of the states, in no way did they do anything wrong. They were stocked up. They were all equipped. Unfortunately, they've never had a thing like this. So they need help from the federal government. So you haven't actually directed any companies. Just this, this is important. You haven't actually directed any companies to start making more ventilators or masks, correct? I have. I have, yes. I have. How many? A lot. A lot. And they're making a lot of ventilators, and they're making a lot of masks. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I have. Mr. President, yes. partially following up on that, are, are there automakers right now who are retooling their production facilities to make uh, ventilators or I can't masks? say they are, but they will be very shortly because we're working with one in particular that wants to make ventilators. They called us yesterday and they're already we're working on a, a transaction. Uh, they're going to make ventilators. They say they've done it before, which surprised me, uh, but they can do it very easily. This is partially for you, partially for Secretary Azar. You said yesterday that you had spoken to Carnival Corporation's chairman. Carnival. Yeah. Yes, and he said that he could donate some ships. No, not donate. That's not the word donate. donate. Okay, he lend, he's lend, not giving them. He's going to let you use them. Okay. I spoke with Mickey lend. Harrison, who is the, the president, chairman, CEO, okay. and, and he, owner. And, and he, he, and he's he could lend some ships out. to potentially he be said he, he said to me that he was willing to, if we need ships, if we need ships for helping people, that Carnival would be absolutely willing to help us in Los Angeles, in New York, wherever they may be, in Miami, where they're very big. Uh, if we needed something, they would be willing to. So far, we haven't needed to, and we're bringing the big hospital ships up in California. We haven't. We're working with the governor of California, as you know, with Gavin, and uh, we haven't made a determination. We're also talking to folks who would like it in Seattle. So we're, we're discussing where it can be most useful. Uh, we've spoken with Governor Cuomo, and we're bringing the big hospital ship up in two weeks, and we're going to have it in New York Harbor, someplace okay, in New York so, Harbor. So, so, my, so my question is, one, it sounds like you haven't taken them up on yet, yet but no, I have you, taken you them could. up. I said if we okay. need it, I'll let you know. Okay. That's secondly, called taking them up. And, and secondly, we, right now we don't need it. Ships have a lot of frequently contacted surfaces, and so this is where you come in, Secretary Azar, potentially Dr. Fauci. Do you have concerns about those you, the cruise ships being used as hospitals? Well, I can tell you they're very clean, and also those surfaces, they, the germ, as you know, the virus disappears over a period of time, and these ships are very clean. They've been kept very clean. They've been gone over, but the virus, as you know, if it's on a surface for a certain, they have actually charts, different kinds of surfaces, it disappears over a period Why of time. Why not use hotels? I, I mean, I, is, what are you trying to get at? Go ahead. Well, that, that's what I'm asking. Why not it just disappears, use hotels? It the, disappears. The, virus disappears when it's on surface after a certain number of, of days, or in some cases hours, depending on the surface yeah, itself. Right. Go ahead, please. Thank you. A quick follow-up. So can you say, can you name any of the companies that you've asked to start making these ventilators or face masks? I will be, but first I want to get the uh, approval from the company, because I don't want to be doing that. Okay. You know, well, I assume well, they'd like it, but I'll let you know. Okay, well, thank you. And this is for Dr. Fauci. Uh, I mean, one company that has openly stated it is General Motors. So that's one of the, did you, one did the, the government ask but I General didn't, Motors? I didn't speak to them about announcing it, but I'll announce it. I'm sure they wouldn't be, but we have others also. Okay, thank you. Okay. And so for Dr. Fauci, there's new research out from that the CDC has released that many of the people that have, or that 13% of the people with the coronavirus got it from someone that was asymptomatic. So my question is, does that change the way the pr approach that should be taken? And do you think that's the case? Or I mean, do you think that, or do you not agree with that research? You know, the, um, the recommendations that are here applies to whether you're in physical contact with someone who could be infected with symptoms versus asymptomatic. I don't really think it changes anything. 
Uh, certainly there is some degree of asymptomatic transmissibility. It's still not quite clear exactly what that is. But uh, when people focus on that, I think they take their eye off the real ball, which is the things you do will mitigate against getting infected, no matter whether you're near someone who is asymptomatic or not. It's the same thing. Physical separation and the care that's outlined here is going to take care of both of those things. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a question about testing. When will every American who needs a test get a test and, and be able to get a test? And why not um, have medical equipment being shipped right now to hospitals who need We're, it? You're hearing very positive things about testing. And just so you understand, we don't want every American to go out and get a test. 350 million people. We don't want that. We want people that are just that, that have a problem, that have a, a problem with they they're sneezing, they're sniffling, they don't feel good, they have a temperature. There are a lot of different things. You know them. You know them better than I do. So ready? We don't need that. But what we are having is we're having these private labs have come in. They've been really fantastic, and we also have a great system for the future. Because as I said, we inherited we meaning this administration an obsolete broken system that wasn't meant for anything like this. Now we have a system that you can see because look, we're well into this and nobody's even talking about it are, except for you, which doesn't Ameri surprise there me. There are Americans though which who say that they have me. symptoms and they can't get yeah, tests. Well, okay. what, do you, what do you say to the Americans I'm not, who are I'm not that hearing it. But we don't want everybody to go out and get a test because there's no reason for it. Yeah. Americans who have symptoms we'll do one can't more after this. Fauci, um, because uh, Kevin Hassett um, is one of the people who is now suggesting that the real way to get to the end of this, for life to return to normal, is for every single person living in this country to be tested. That way you could see who's contagious, and you could then have people who don't have it go back to work. Um, is there any possibility that this country could ever get to a point where every single person could be tested, and how long would that take? Thank you for the question. I've heard that before. I don't see, I don't connect the dots there. I don't see how testing everybody in the country is going to help you to implement this. This should be implemented universally, at least at this level for everyone. The things we spoke about a while ago that you want to really ratchet it up, like Governor Newsom is doing in California, like Governor Cuomo is doing in New York, or how you put an end to this outbreak. Testing is important. It would be nice to know, and there are certain things you could do, but let's not conflate testing with the action that we have to take. Whether or not you test, do this. I'm not, I'm not putting down testing as an important issue, but people seem to link them so much that if you don't have universal testing, you can't respond to the outbreak. You really can. But, but I do think, and that's after listening to Tony and everybody else that's an expert, I do think it's important that not everybody be tested if you feel great and if you have no symptoms whatsoever it's it's a it's just not a good thing to be doing all right steve no, uh, a question for dr fauci uh, yesterday you mentioned the possibility of aerosol transmission of the virus how likely is that to happen I mean, that oh, the, the possibility of aerosol transmission always comes up when you have situations like that it comes up with influenza it came up with sars in which there was a documented you know, one-off episode of some aerosol transmission. Aerosol means that it can stay in the air for a period of time because it's in a droplet that's very small and doesn't go down. Is it possible and that there is aerosol transmission? Uh, yeah, it certainly is. But clearly, what we have seen in the situations where people have gotten infected from the areas that we have experienced, China, South Korea, now Europe, most of it is in a situation where people are close enough to each other that a symptomatic person will have a, dro a real droplet transmission. So I'm not ruling out the possibility that it's aerosol. But again, it's not going to substantially change doing this. Let me just ask this in a very simple way. What is the demand pressure on testing in this country and are we meeting it? Yeah. I get the same calls that many of you get that someone goes into a place who has a symptom and wants to get a test, and for one reason or other, multiple logistic, technical, what have you, they can't get it. That is a reality that is happening now. Is it the same as it was a few weeks ago? Absolutely not, because as the Secretary and others have said, right now that we have the private sector involved, the availability, 
not only just availability, but the implementation of the availability is getting better and better and better. Having said that, I, I understand and empathize with the people who rightfully are saying, I'm trying to get a test and I can't. So, so is that a way of saying we are not yet at a point where we are meeting the demand pressure? Well, the answer is yes, uh, John. We are not there yet because otherwise people would be never calling up saying they can't get a test. Well, I just can't emphasize enough about the incredible progress that we have made on testing. All of your reporting um, and, and uh, media outlets around the country are as well that, um, that many, many more tests are being performed every day, literally by the tens of thousands. And this has only been made possible because several weeks ago the president brought in the commercial labs, these enormous companies, Quest and LabCorp, working with companies like Croche and, and Abbott uh, Laboratories and Thermo Fisher and 